I want to go over the interior extremum theorem, also known as Fermi's theorem. The idea here, and I'm sure you've learned this before if you've taken a calculus class, this is the key idea behind optimization problems, how you solve them. I'll just get right into what the theorem states. We let f be a differentiable function on an open interval from a to b. Let's say maybe this is our a here, and this is our b. What the theorem says is if f attains a maximum value at some point c, which is in our open interval, so what that means is that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all the other values on our interval then the derivative of f at c is zero. And this holds true the same for minimum values on such an interval. So this is true when c is a maximum value. For example, maybe this is our c. It looks like this would be our c on a to b. This is our maximum value. f of c is our maximum value. And as we've learned, f prime of c is equal to zero. In this video, I want to show why this is always the case. And before anything else, I want to um, uh, emphasize why we're dealing with open intervals, which is something new that we didn't really see in a calculus class. Um, and the reason that is, and you can think about this yourself, if I were to include a, for example, in our interval, well, it so happens that the actual maximum value then becomes, it's something over here, right? f of a, and clearly f of a here um, does not have a derivative of zero, so that really wouldn't work out. So by excluding the endpoints a and b, we're able to kind of force this value c to be, to fit in enough space to see that its derivative is equal to zero. I encourage you I encourage you to think about that. Like I said, um, let's say this is our C value here. Well, let's take the, um, you know what, let's use the same interval from A to B. And here's C, here's F of C. I claim, you know, F of C is this maximum value on our interval. I want to show F prime of C is zero. And one way of doing that is looking just visually at the left side of C, we've got these positive slopes that seem to be getting, you know, less and less positive. And kind of complementary, we got this, we have these negative slopes on the right side of C that seem to be getting less and less negative. The key part of this proof is that this is an open interval, which allows us to actually, you know, take some region about C, I'll call this the epsilon neighborhood of C, and create two sequences, X sub n and Y sub n, which both approach C from opposite directions and are strictly less than and greater than C. That is, X sub n is going to be less than C, and that C is going to be less than our sequence Y sub n. However, x sub n approaches c from the left side, and y sub n also approaches c, but from the right side. And to frame this or um, phrase this more formally, we would say, you know, let me clear this up. I'm not going to read too much about this, but, you know, we can create some neighborhood of points, and these would be um, two possible sequences we can use as candidates of sequences that approach C from both sides. And this is kind of more a formal way of phrasing what I just said. The idea here is to take advantage of the left hand positive slopes and the right hand negative slopes. Ooh, that's a Y. <laughs> I'm on negative side. And try and force this top point at C, F of C, force it to be flat force the derivative to equal zero. So I'm going to kind of remake our sequence. Here's our x of c, and notice that, like I said, for all natural numbers in, try and write this relatively quickly, we have that x sub n is strictly less than c, 
which is the same thing as saying x sub n minus c is less than zero. Similarly, on the right side, we may have a sequence y sub n. Here's our sequence y sub n. And again, for all natural numbers n, this time c is strictly less than y sub n, which implies that, well, this implies that y sub n minus c is greater than zero. You might see where I'm going in just a second, but recall that f of c we're assuming is a maximum value, meaning f of c is going to be greater than or equal to all the other values on our interval from a to b, including the values of the sequence, right? So we can also say for all natural numbers in that f of c is going to be greater than or equal to f of x sub n. This is for all the elements in our sequence. We've got this inequality. Um, and this inequality also shows up for y sub n. So um, f of c is going to be greater than or equal to y of, or um, f of y sub n. Okay, and now we're able to form our um, strategy of forcing f prime of c to be zero. I want to point out we can construct f prime of c using these two sequences. For example, the left sequence, consider, um, well, before that, let's just consider the difference quotient f of x sub n minus f of c over x sub n minus c. Our numerator, what's our numerator's sign? Looks like our numerator, if I were to subtract this f of c, we'd have zero as greater than or equal to this numerator, meaning the numerator is going to be negative, or it could be zero, or it could be negative. x sub n minus c is strictly negative. So no matter what, and you can think about this, this difference quotient is going to be greater than or equal to zero. If the numerator and denominator are both negative, we've got a, neg a positive number, right? And if the numerator is zero, well, we have zero. By definition, then, again, you can think about why this is the case. The limit as n approaches infinity of f of x sub n minus f of c over x sub n minus c, this is f prime of c. And by the order limit theorem, I'll abbreviate it OLT, since all the terms in this limit are greater than or equal to zero, f prime of c has to be greater than or equal to zero. And this corresponds with our picture very nicely. For our sequence x sub n right there, all of our slopes are positive. From here, it doesn't, um, it's pretty straightforward um, to show that, you know, we'll, f of y sub n minus f of c over um, just y sub n minus c. This numerator is going to be, when we subtract a c, is going to be um, negative. The denominator, though, is going to be strictly positive. Or I guess the numerator is um, negative or zero, meaning this whole thing is going to be less than or equal to zero. Notice the limit as n approaches infinity of this character right there, f of y sub n minus f of c over y sub n minus c. This is by definition f prime of c. By the order limit theorem again, this is less than or equal to zero. We have that f prime of c is greater than or equal to zero. f prime of c is less than or equal to zero. So of course, f prime of c has to be equal to zero. And we are done. Thank you for watching.